at the Psychotherapy Development Center, um, with, with whom we hope you all come and collaborate on some of this work. Um, we've, one of the treatments that we've been developing is cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, if you don't know what cognitive behavioral therapy is, Brett talked about it a little bit. I mean, it's just sort of the apple pie motherhood of, of, of therapy. It works for just about everything, um, any kind of behavioral disorder at all. It's safe, it's very broadly effective. It works for you know, skills training for depression, anxiety, um, safe sex, you name it, and it's durable. Um, while not necessarily more effective than any other empirically validated treatment we have at this point, it certainly is durable. And we've shown sleeper effects where people continue to improve even after they leave treatment. But what I had was a horrible dissemination problem. Great, NIDA publishes the manual, it's, they send it to every clinician in the country, and nobody uses it. <laughs> That's the thing. Um, CBT, although, I have no place to, oh. Um, CBT, although sort of wonderful, um, is, is kind of hard to, to, to learn. Uh, clinicians have practically no time at this point to, to, to do it. Um, if, if you're not great at it, it can seem like it's, it's really repetitive. Um, and, and what generally happens now in um, drug abuse treatment programs is that clinicians can have uh, caseloads of up to 90 people in a week. There's no way you can deliver CBT effectively um, under, under those conditions. And so we have very weak delivery. Um, and this, is, this will be sort of an echo of what you've heard all through the day. But why I moved to computer facilitated delivery um, were, were things like we, we, we know effective implementation of CBT is very, very rare. I've taken something like four or 500 tapes of treatment as usual. Um, from, a, from a CTN study and looked at, even though the people were saying they were doing CBT, the actual number of times CBT was recognizable in those tapes was about 20 times. It's just not happening. 20 out of 400 times of skills training was even mentioned. Um, we also know that only a small fraction of people with addiction-related treatment as problems actually access treatment. We've talked about rural and underserved populations. Um, and the way I think about these um, treatments so far is not necessarily a standalone interventions. We haven't gotten that far yet. Um, but certainly as clinician extenders, the clinician can serve as a case manager or a general contractor. Oh, you've got substance use. Here's beating the blues. Oh, you know. You, oh, you know. So they can sort of direct people to the correct um, uh, computer uh, assisted therapy. Um, they're broadly accessible and available all the time. And I'm, I'm really beginning to think that there are some things computers can do better than some clinicians, uh, one of which is actually show examples, uh, show people really implementing them in a, in a, in a wide variety of, of situations. And we'll get back to that in a second. Um, they're, um, you know, unlike a therapy, unlike a, a therapist, uh, the computer doesn't really get bored, and so you can certainly individualize. You can, re you know, the patient can do whatever he wants with them. Um, and, and I'm a uh, psychotherapy researcher, and you probably can't see the purple. But one thing this is is yes, it gets therapies out there. The other thing it does is that for the first time ever, we can really control our therapies. And so instead of just throwing CBT or these big packages to people as a mishmash, what these um, what computer assisted therapies let us do is, is sort of direct specifically what modules and what components go to what people, and we can begin to understand what's really important, what's an, what's an active ingredient of the treatment, and what's not so important. Um, and you have standardization of treatment, which we certainly don't have in substance use treatment. Um, so I got a, a, a NIDA uh, Merit Award for, in order to develop um, what we call CBT for CBT. Um, we took it from, we took the content from our NIDA uh, CBT manual, which had been validated many times. So um, it has seven modules. They take about an hour each. Um, and what we wanted to do was think about <laughs> Well, what, what, we, what we wanted to do was, was, was not put up a, a web-based system with just a lot of text to read. There's an awful lot of systems like that. Um, and our thinking was there's no way a cocaine user is going to sit through that. Uh, just so we, we had to make it engaging, fun, um, something people really wanted to do. So it, you know, so I, I sort of did it, you know, so the, um, I basically ripped it off from Clifford the Big Red Dog. 
um, which, ta <laughs> which taught my daughter to read. So we make lots of multimedia use presentation of skills through movies. We hired actual actors um, and, and, and directors to um, shoot these little movies of real people in difficult high risk situations. Um, they would not use coping skills, screw up and use drugs. Then we use a variety of different multimedia to, to uh, teach them the, te teach the skills. And then they see the movie again, but this time it has a different ending because you see the person use the skill. Um, and so it's really fun. And we did lots of quizzes and interactive exercises and lots and lots and lots of homework. Um, so this is just an example of our um, safe sex module. So there's this couple at this party, and she drinks and succumbs to his advances. It's, it's terrible. We teach the skill, and then she um, responds assertively. She doesn't drink. She, you see her actually use all the skills. Um, and so we did a, our, this is our first trial. Um, it was done as a pilot, so you have to keep that in mind. Uh, what we did was just add CBT for CBT to treatment as usual at a community uh, drug abuse center in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, patients could, um, who were assigned to that condition could come to the clinic and uh, use the CBT for CT, CBT program up to twice a week in the little therapist's office. It was all private, um, and we did a six-month follow-up. Uh, and, and as you've been hearing too, in these web-based studies, it's, it's really nice because you really can kind of take all comers. Uh, you don't have to restrict your population too much. And CBT for CBT is very broad as to what type of drug use, alcohol, um, pretty much everybody can use it. So we've got a, a nice, I think, representative uh, population. This was not an easy population, so only about 70% were working. A lot had that little probation push into treatment. Um, and most people were using a lot of whatever. 79% um, were users of more than one drug plus alcohol. And for this little eight week thing, so twice a week, on average, people finished maybe seven sessions, which was OK. Um, we got a, a, a statistically significant effect on, on urine specimens, which is hard to do in a, in a drug study. Um, so this looked very, very good for its first outing. Um, that also translated to good outcomes in terms of longest consecutive period of abstinence, which is important for drug abuse research because that's usually a really strong indicator of how people are going to do in the long term. <coughs> Um, and people love this. Um, they, I th it's, it's fun. It's interesting. The clinicians were sneaking upstairs to look at the program, and they'd say, oh, now I get what CBT is. And I'm like, oh, great. You know, you said you've been doing it. Um, so we've actually developed a, um, a working alliance inventory for technology. Because it does appear that people really do get connected um, to these kinds of things. And I think Brett referred to that, they, um, or the characters or whatever. So we're, we're sort of chasing that down. And I was a little worried that the clinicians would be alienated by this. Oh my god, you're going to take, take over and um, not let me be a clinician anymore. They really saw it as an extender um, of their work as well, and we're, we're quite positive about it. Um, just very quickly, the other things that we've, we found out, um, I think you mentioned before, Technology is just a way of delivering something. And it matters if that something is good or if it stinks. Um, and so we wanted to see, well, are we really delivering something that looks like CBT? So does it teach the coping skills that we're targeting? Does that make any difference at all? And do we see the sleeper effect? And by god, yes. Um, so we have this little um, task where we get people to articulate the, the skills that they've learned. And you know, generally, they start out saying, in a high risk situation, oh, I just go out and use. At the end of treatment, they tend to be able to say something like, oh, I wouldn't go to the party. Or they can, they can articulate a, a, um, a coping skill. So that's not necessarily proof that they've got the behavior, but they can talk the talk. Now, the fun thing about CBT for CBT is, even though we stopped access to the program at the end of the eight weeks, we got a sleeper effect for skills acquisition. Their skills got better six months into it, which was really interesting. And I think that, I hope that reflects that what we try to do is teach these CB skills as very generalizable. So coping with craving is something you, you do um, to, to kind of get over a, a period of craving, but it's also a great metaphor for learning affect tolerance and response inhibition. And we teach it that way. Here's the specific thing, but here's how it's tied to sort of general um, effective behavior. 
Um, and we got the sleep of, sleeper effect on drug use, too. So here's this little program um, over eight weeks, and we're seeing effects on, on substance use um, and urines six months later. So that was really pretty good. Um, although it's sort of a no-brainer to say these things are cost effective, you can at least get a paper out of it. So, <laughs> um, so we worked with Todd Olmsted from um, uh, LEPH and, and did a little um, cost effectiveness thing. And, 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 and this, is, this is in comparison to some of our other evidence-based treatment for addictions. But um, you know, when, once the thing is built, it's, it's sort of a no-brainer. It's cheaper um, and more effective than treatment, as usual, um, when you bring it up to scale. Um, so we're doing a lot now. So that we, we've, um, we just finished a trial. We, we added the HIV module that covers both um, needle use and, and um, safe sex behavior. Um, we've done that at the App Foundation. We've got 100 randomized now. We've got fMRI and genetics on it. We're looking at um, things like do they actually understand the CBT concepts. Uh, we've also got a, um, a, a complicated factorial trial in a methadone population in Bridgeport. And what we're doing there um, is seeing if we, it's, cognitive behavioral therapy is very cognitively demanding on patients. Um, and since most of our patients come in with memory and attention problems, uh, we're, we're using um, galantamine, uh, which is used in mild de dementia, to see if we, we can sort of amp up their brains a little bit and, and deliver CBT um, more effectively, or at least get them to remember it. Um, we're in the middle of a planning stages of a VA um, CS uh, a cooperative studies where we'll be looking at hopefully uh, treatment as usual, treatment as usual plus CBT or CBT alone. Um, we're, we're evaluating it um, in comparison to um, individual treatment. Um, and we're waiting to hear about a couple things. Um, a Spanish version is a no-brainer. Um, I, I, I am so tired of 25 years in this wor work and never being able to um, get people who only speak Spanish into our trials because they can't manage all these kinds of things. This just seems like a, a great thing to do. Um, so now I want to get to the caveats because it seems like everybody's talking about that. So computer-assisted therapy is great, 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 great. They're available. You can't master multiple EBPs. They're cheap. But the question is also sort of why, why we, when we have these, what do we do with them? I've never, in my 25 years of work, had anything anybody ever wanted to buy. Um, you know, but all of a sudden, I publish this paper, and everybody wants to buy CBT for CBT. It's one trial with 70 patients in one outpatient setting. How do we know it actually works? And so um, one of the things that, that we get to with this is once we develop these things, how do we really know that they work? And there's huge temptation to disseminate quickly. And I just want to be a little careful about, about how we do that. Um, so should we just assume that all these things are safe and effective? I don't know that. Um, should we assume that broad dissemination, and even if it does a little bit of good, that's better than nothing? I don't know. Um, there's a lot of adverse events that could be associated with broad dissemination of these things before we're ready. People could drop out of treatment. They could, they could interpret um, something that the computer does in, a, in an inappropriate way. They could detox themselves too fast. They could you know, do, go through an exposure protocol too fast. <laughs> Nobody is reporting on adverse events so far. And confidentiality is a huge thing, um, with illegal drug users at least. There is no computer system that can't be hacked. Uh, so when we went to the web for this, what we had to do very carefully uh, was set up the program where under no circumstances could we track IP addresses or have any sort of open boxes where the patients could put in information that could be damaging. So we'd be really, really careful. Um, so I probably don't have any time to do this, but um, uh, with, with Brian uh, Killick, we just published and it's on the web, a methodological analysis of computer-assisted therapies. And what we tried to do, so it's, 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 it, it came out like last week. What we did was just survey the literature on treatment of adults with Axis one disorders via computer-assisted therapy. Um, and this was not an, a, a, a typical meta-analysis. All we wanted to do is just see how good is the data on which all this is based. Oh, um, oh yeah. Okay, because, you know, 
there's a lot of things going on with internet research that, that make it complicated. How do you know you're actually dealing with a patient or their dog? Um, and just very briefly, is we've developed a coding system for um, evaluating the quality of the research. And this is a, a quick overview. They do fine with randomization, but as was mentioned before, there's huge follow-up. And only 15% of the studies bother to have a follow-up that gets at least 80% of the intention to treat sample. So we're just looking at outcomes for the people who get the therapy and like it. Um, there's also huge problems with assessment in terms of self-report only. Oh, do you feel better? Yeah, I feel better. Great. You know, so um, it's important to get biological or some sort of independent evaluation of what's going on. Huge problems with missing data. Um, and a lot of the studies, it was sort of interesting, the, the UK um, National Health Service adopted this program called Beating the Blues for Depression on the basis of, I think, five studies for depression in which none of the participants met criteria uh, for, for actual access one de depression. They were just sort of bummed out. I mean, so people get so excited, they, they kind of get ahead of the data here. Um, there's very little data on um, adherence and um, internal validity, um, as well as the credibility of the control condition. Um, so what we found in, so there's about 75 studies that are out there now. None of them met current methodological standards that would be required for either a real behavioral trial or a uh, pharmacologic trial. No studies reporting on adverse events. We have to get ahead of that. Um, I went through some of the common problems a minute ago. The most common desi design for these things is, here's my insomnia treatment. Here's my weightless control. Just get self-report on patients. That doesn't really show anything. So we have to, we have to really be careful. Um, so we're, um, the, the, the methodology, I think, has to ca catch up to our excitement and, um, to some degree, um, let the buyer beware when we come to some of these things.